We're live. Take it away, Mark. Okay. Um, so Tamara and Yoon, as well as uh, Manuel Serrano uh, at INRIA have been applying formal methods to analyze the security properties of CES. And we've been having, we had an interesting uh, email thread uh, in which I think there's been some confusion about what precisely the security claims are that we're making about CES. What do we mean by the object capability security model? What do we mean when we say that we think CES enforces it? Um, and uh, how that relates to the security properties that uh, this group at INRIA is trying to verify. So with that, I'll turn it, into, turn it over to uh, Tamara and you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mark, uh, for the invitation. And I'm very, very happy to be here to discuss these things with you. Um, uh, it's nice to meet you all. I actually met uh, Jim first <laughs> in, the, in another uh, Zoom room. <laughs> we were both there. Um, it's funny. So um, yeah, okay, to be precise, uh, we, um, we didn't start uh, by looking at CES uh, security. What, what we were uh, doing uh, was developing a security property um, based on information flow security. Well, these are details. Uh, but once we had the security property that we like, that we, should, that we think, I will tell you this, uh, the security property later, but once we had the security property that we thought uh, was a, a strong uh, security property, but also realistic, like it could really be applied to, to, to JavaScript programs uh, like they are used today. Uh, then we started to look at different systems and there is where we, we came to CES. And for this, uh, we built a, a series of, of test programs. We didn't start doing any proof because of course to do proof is, is difficult because we have to deeply understand uh, all the systems we, we wanted to try, and then we had to formalize this. And this is very complicated. Something much easier was to start by um, writing a, a set of test programs uh, that we knew violate our property. Okay, we, we started by doing this, and we tested a CES um, BM2. And, uh, well, we did with Caja and also something uh, we developed, uh, actually Yonsoc developed, that I will tell you later. Um, we call it uh, SGS. And we, we, we tested all these systems and, and there is where we found the test case, uh, Mark, I sent you uh, by email the, the very first time. Um, at the beginning, we uh, maybe me, I, I should talk for me only here, uh, I didn't really realize what exactly it meant, this test case. Um, I, I think now I, I have a very clear uh, understanding of what uh, was going on. So essentially what happens is uh, the test case I sent you is, it just means uh, that says is not uh, satisfying the security property as we thought it was, that's all. But after the, the discussions we had with you uh, and more discussions, we, many more discussions we had offline uh, with Yonsoc, um, now we, we believe, and that's why uh, where we need your input, that maybe um, if we get to explain to you the, the property, uh, and because uh, that part is, uh, I don't know, because um, yeah, we, we have, um, how familiar are you with uh, formal semantics? Uh, I, uh, I am not a formalist. Um, uh, some people here are, are much more formal than I am. Uh, uh, some people are not. Uh, I, uh, as, as you might know from my writing, uh, there's very, very little mathematical notation, but I try to express things in prose very precisely. I've yes, worked that's with, correct. Yeah, I, I've worked with a good number of formalists over many years and had very good collaborations, uh, but I always need them to re-explain to me their ideas in, in, in precise prose before I can really understand it. Uh, or code, code, is, a form, code is, a, is itself, of course, a formalism that I'm very uh, good okay. at. Uh, but 
um, I just, when things get um, uh, deep in the, the mathematical notation and the, the uh, you know, uh, late latex um, uh, formulas and the Greek letters and all that, I just stopped following. Oops. Um, so for me, uh, you know, uh, these Greek letters uh, are, are just another way of coding. For me, uh, uh, formal languages is just a way to, to precisely express what we want. But I, I agree that if we, uh, if we if one is not used to, to read this language, um, then, well, it's difficult to understand. But uh, by, uh, by the exchange of females that we have had, I, I think we can, uh, if we try, we can uh, get to, I can get to, to explain, uh, at, at least to you, Mark, um, I, I don't know the backgrounds of uh, all the rest of the people here, but uh, at least to you, I'm pretty uh, sure that we can get to, to, to communicate here. Like, uh, uh, even if there are a lot of Greek letters, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then if you think, uh, I mean, you all think that uh, this property might work, uh, then um, uh, Johnson and, and me already, uh, once we have your agreement, like uh, you also are convinced, like at least intuitively, we can already prove, uh, you know, with the model first, that the property holds for says we will get there. Uh, and, and of course, if there is some interest, we could also later on, because that's another long project, that part is easy, but later on, we could also try to do this, you know, um, with the help of the guys that are doing um, uh, EGMAScript uh, in Coq. The, the JS, you know, uh, Alan and uh, Alan. Alan, Alan Schmidt, Alan. awesome. Alan Schmidt, I, I, I know you know him um, because he's in the in the same committee as you, but um, you know, uh, he has a previous uh, formalization of Eggman script in Coq. Um, she is cert, but this formalization is, is, uh, is, is not good, I mean, it's good, it's good, it's very good, the formalization, but we cannot prove anything. And Alan himself will tell you this. The pro there is some problem with um, the size of invariance that it generates when you want to prove something, it doesn't matter now. So Alan decided to, to write another uh, style of semantics that he's uh, finishing like right now, like it's good timing. And with this one, with this new one that is based on skeleton, it is possible to prove things in Coq. So it's like a good moment. If we find a property, you know, if we agree on a property and we find it, uh, then we can re actually do real things, like uh, prove things in Coq, it's uh, very strong. Like, but okay, this is just uh, dreaming because we are not even there. Um, okay. Uh, you also know of uh, Philippa Gardner? Of uh, also in the JSF yes. at Imperial. Yes, I know her. Okay, uh, but I, I mostly uh, collaborate with with Alan because okay. he we are in the same project at Imperial. Yeah. yeah. The reason I ask is that um, uh, I've also uh, colla collaborated with her, and she also has as part of the JSF project a different formalization of JavaScript. Um. Well, she was working with Alan too, right? She she was in the GSRT project and, and she developed this separation logic. That's what you're talking about? She's done a lot of work on separation logic. I don't I don't think that the alternate formalization of JavaScript that I'm referring to uh, is based on her separation logic work, but I could be wrong about that. Um, in any case, uh, I, th I think I don't think we need to go uh, deeper into that right now. The um, okay. uh, the main thing is to, to proceed with what you're doing and how you're trying to analyze CES. Uh, and let me emphasize, we are very, very interested in seeing formal methods applied to CES. We are like overjoyed that you guys are looking at this and want to do everything we can to encourage it. Okay, so just don't, don't get uh, too enthusiastic. Maybe the, the, the property will not work at all. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, let, let's see. Um, so, Luca, um, I, I 
don't have slides and, and I apologize for this. So I, I want to go directly to the property. So do you feel like, you know, in good shape? <laughs> Adjust your seat, belt, your seat belts then because. <laughs> All right, so uh, do you mind, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Bingo. Okay. Do, do you see anything? I do. Okay, why do you not see you now? Ah, yes, there you are. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, so all uh, I'm sorry. I know, I know, a lot of symbols, <laughs> but don't worry, don't worry. It's all very, very easy. So um, uh, don't, don't look at the screen, please. <laughs> look at me and, and I'll tell you things and then we can see that things in the screen. So, um. Uh, okay, so essentially there is uh, the following idea. The following idea, uh, before you look at the formulas, I want to tell you the idea um, because I think we will more discuss on the idea later on than on the real formulas. Um, so what is the idea? Wait, wait, Every time. Mean, it's too small. What? The font is too small, so maybe you can just a little bit. Thanks. Okay, so um, um, okay. So what you call a compartment, okay? What you call a compartment for us here is a little notation um, that we call a security level. So. Uh, so we call security level a compartment. So here is a security level. You can see um, there is this letter here. And okay, there is some problem with the, okay, there. Uh, there is this security level. And remember, just keep in mind that this security level is a compartment. So what is the idea? I'm sorry, the, uh, the text that you highlighted, I can no. Oh, oh, it says it just says security level W. Okay, got it. Okay. That okay. W is is a, a compartment. That's the, the only thing that I, I have said so far. So okay. so in order to express security, I was talking in my emails about end-to-end -end security. So uh, Mark, you told me you, you were uh, aware of, about this. However, is uh, you know there is a lot of debate of what is really end-to-end -end design. And here I don't even have a network. You know that the first paper was talking about networking and uh, proving things and, uh, in the end. So for security, in a, in the academic world, uh, what we call end-to-end -end security are information flow properties where we can say what the attacker, what the attacker knows at the beginning of the execution and what the attacker knows at the end of the execution. So if the attacker knows the same at the beginning and at the end, for example, what he knows is called the public information. If he knows exactly the same quantity of things, then uh, we say we have end-to-end -end security and we have different names for different properties, but the idea is that one. Okay, so um, how do we say what uh, an attacker knows uh, in, in this kind of um, security properties? In order to say what the attacker knows, we say um, that the attacker knows exactly the same information uh, in, every, um, in every execution. Well, I haven't introduced that. So, um, Okay, let, let me guide you in this very first part. So we have a memory here, mu1 and mu2. So the idea is every time uh, the, program, the program will be executed in one memory, for example, mu1, the attacker will see um, some public variables, some public state. And uh, in, a, in, a second in any other execution that will have the same public state, the attacker, um, so we consider all of those together. So if the attacker sees the same public state at the beginning, 
then at the end of the execution, like you execute all of your JavaScript program uh, using says or not, you can see here in this definition, we, we are not talking about says, it's, we are talking about the ends. So what is in the middle, we don't care. It can be says, but it can be anything. So at the ends, uh, what happens is the attacker will see the same thing. Like he will not learn anything else of what he already knew. So this works really fine, but this is a totally unrealistic because of course uh, in real life you have to share. So, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> so obviously uh, uh, like that, as I told you, it doesn't work, but uh, of course people have been working on doing things and uh, on how to express also this. And the idea is, um, Whatever you share, whatever you share uh, during your execution, you will somehow record, you will record this. You will record what you're sharing, okay? And, and then uh, you, you will make sure that uh, if what you're recording, that's the only thing that attacker knows, all the rest uh, will be preserved. Um, so the, the knowledge of the attacker will be limited to what you share. Is it, um, is it, is it too early to um, uh, uh, use a concrete example, a very simple concrete example to uh, explain what these properties look like uh, concretely? Um, um, yeah, we can do that. Um, We don't have anything. Um, I, so here, for example, um, I, I'm trying to think uh, a, a way to, to explain to you. Um, I, I think I haven't told you enough yet in order okay. to, okay. The, to really... Um, Okay, so so uh, so so then in that case, just you know, proceed uh, and to get us to the point where we can then try to understand it in terms of the example. Okay, um, so yeah, so uh, essentially, what we are going to do is uh, we're going to re record everything that is uh, explicitly um, uh, shared with the attacker and. For us, the way we record it is by using, okay, so this that you see here, you don't have to worry because this is something you know very well. This is a JavaScript semantics, okay? It's written in my language, uh, you know, in the language of former methods, but this is a ECMAScript, <laughs> okay, some version of it. So this is ECMAScript except for the blue parts. The, the blue part, um, the blue parts are, are the things I was telling you we record. So for example, here we record that uh, something has been uh, shared to the com um, from compartment uh, W to compartment W prime. So um, uh, this has been shared, uh, and this is called, um, in this case, uh, B prime this uh, is something that has been shared, and it has been shared while we execute it in this memory. So this is precisely uh, when you share something, um, when you expose something. Um, so we record this in, in Sigma, in, in this, uh, yeah, in this, um, uh, inst we instrumented uh, ECMAScript in order to record these things. Um, and are we talking about sharing information? Or are we talking about sharing object references? Yes, exactly. That is like the capabilities. Okay. Those are the, those are the capabilities. Yeah. Um, here is a, a slightly more abstract um, because we are not talking, it can be a reference. So this can be a reference, no problem. I mean, this can be, I mean, whatever. 
um, in particular uh, reference, but um, uh, okay. Uh, and this is a part um, where uh, we say, okay, if uh, you share exactly the same things, if the, the attacker knowledge was, uh, ha, uh, if the attacker knew something, and moreover, we share with him the same things, then at the end, the attacker knowledge has only growth by what we have explicitly shared. Okay. And it, uh, the, the word explicit is, is very important. Okay, so now I'm over with the with the high level. So, um, so yeah. So do you think you have this uh, example we discussed the other day? You know, this very simple because you know with the two memories, so we can show something very simple with the identity. You know, interaction policy. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, but. Uh... Are you sure that it is it will work? I, I don't know. Okay, maybe. Well, I think it's better than this one. Wait, wait, wait. wait. But but could could you come back to the semantics? Semantics. Could you come back to the semantics? Yeah. Here, uh, I would uh, I want to emphasize one more point. Here, when we uh, share record, uh, share um, we uh, Tamara said that we record everything we shared, but. Here, the important point here is that when you share a reference, what you record is that we also record all the values of the reference from the reference. So for example, if you, when you share, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you share object O, then object O may have a field X. So here, what we record is, let's say, if O has an X field X and its, uh, its value was 10, then we record O and field X and value 10. And then after that, if, um, if this value has been uh, changed to 20, then this value 20 must be protected from the other side because we did not share this changed, updated value. So this yeah. is, I think- That's a good point, yes. Important point here. And maybe, the, can I share my screen? Uh, yes, I will, I will stop sharing. Are you uh, going to- to show uh, these examples. Yeah, yeah. I, I see it. Yeah, can you see this? The, the top pane with the red text is, is the very low contrast. It's very hard to read. It's not important. Okay. Okay. Oh, much better. Yes. Okay. Okay. Maybe we should start from the non-interference property. So basically, without sharing, without sharing, uh, the non-interference property means that uh, let's say this h is a high variable, and let's say this low l is a low variable, which is a attacker, attacker memory. Then, important point here is that uh, if this high variable, uh, depending depending on this high variable, the value of low, low variable is different. It means that attacker observes something. So basically, this is the non-interference property. But the the big non-interference property is end-to-end -end guarantee, which means that if you uh, reset this L to three, then at the end, attackers see nothing because of the the variable, value of variable L is always three. So in this case, non-interference properties say that this program is secure. You said non-interference? Yeah, non-interference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, this is uh, just basic uh, non-interference example. And now we uh, any the declassifications, which means that we want to share something and then we still want to preserve some property. And here, this is some example, but this for example was a slightly uh, complex. So maybe I can explain first. Okay, this M1 and M2, uh, these are two memories. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, Yonsok, uh, let me say just something. Um, we were writing this example uh, 
to to simplify what we thought uh, CES was doing with our initial um, test case. Um, so we're trying to explain by very simple memories here uh, what we thought CES is doing. Uh, and, and I want to motivate you a little bit here. Uh, in, the, in the second example, this is a handler one. No, where is... Um, do you also have the example where there is a handler or not? Yes. Okay, uh, and we have another example uh, in, in which uh, we, uh, in the other case, we think um, that is the other case in, in which we think says uh, will satisfy with this uh, DDR property. So, so this one, try to, to, to think about this one as, as the first, uh, uh, test case I sent you. Sorry, this is not about that. Oh. Okay, so I don't understand what I'm <laughs> saying, but here what I'm trying to explain is that what is our security property first? Okay, so here uh, we extend our uh, non interference property to JavaScript in JavaScript level and I will explain what do, you, what do you mean by secure here with the classification. So basically, the, there are two memories, M1 and M2. Let's assume that. And this uh, trusted, these three lines are trusted memory. And this, these untrusted are the, just the attacker memory. And here, I just did not ex uh, explicitly show the location and reference or something, but just assume that this O is an object and O is uh, some reference object. And then this reference points to empty object. And this H is uh, just a variable, global variable, and its value is true. And yeah, there is some, okay. Maybe we should talk about this. So these two memories, M1 and M2, uh, only difference is H, value of H. So basically this M1 and M2 in, in the attacker point of view, these are these two are indistinguishable. So okay. from, yeah, from the beginning, the attacker knows nothing and yeah. it's, we are same equivalent in point of um, attacker's model. And then uh, depending on high variable, O dot X is 10 or 20. And the uh, low pro attacker in the attacker code, he can access O so that he can see the value of O dot X. But before it, it, uh, before this program, he already knows this. Uh, okay, sorry, this should be O. So yeah, he already knows this reference. Uh, I think it is better to write three here. Sorry for the inconvenience. So anyway, so after I execute these two programs, the, the memory is M1 prime and M2 prime. And in M1 prime, the, there is now uh, X is 10 and Z is, ah, okay, Z is 10. So he observes some difference. So basically this program does not satisfy the non-interference property. And now I will add declassification. So uh, here we will add declassify. Let's say he allows to access O to untrusted. There's no clear syntax. Anyway, so even if they declassify O here, uh, because this O.x is updated after the declassification, it means that attacker code must not see this difference, 10 or 20. So at the end, is this program is insecure in our point of view. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so, but, so yeah, this definitely helps me understand our previous conversation because the, the um, capability grant is a grant of continued access yeah. to the object. It's exactly. not a disclosing of a snapshot of information. So if you grant access to a location, then the 
receiver of the access by repeatedly reading that location can, can, can uh, be aware of what, uh, the, the changing values of the location. Yep. Yes, yep. but uh, Mark, if, uh, if you can install, uh, I don't know how you call it actually, uh, for me it's a membrane. Yes. Um, if, if you use a membrane and you have a handler, um, so it, it's still capabilities. And in that case, for us, it will satisfy the property. Well, it depends on what the membrane does, or it depends. No, for on us, what... for us, it doesn't. Oh, it no, does. I, I would explain. Oh, that. I see. It, let me. Let me. So, I suppose it depends on on what you mean by explicitly declassify. If you think yeah. of every action through the membrane, uh, every individual action as being a declassifying action then when you read through the membrane and the membrane discloses the current value, then from your point of view, the membrane is uh, declassifying for every read operation. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, that is correct. And there is a, and there is a rational before. There is, a, there is an explanation behind this. It's because of the implicit accesses. It's because of the kind of uh, Problems I I, I I show you in the in the first okay problem is not the adequate uh, word um, is because of of the kind of things we like to to avoid um, like prototype pollution which which is implicit actually um, if you don't like if you share the global and the other code is uh, polluting your own prototype and you cannot even control that, then for us, that's a problem. Uh, and we cannot prove anything about that. Uh, and we can prove capability safety, what you just said, like once a capability is granted, all is yours. This we can, but we want something more, we want something stronger, something where we can say, okay, what's the knowledge of the attacker at the end of the day? We want to say more. Okay, so, so here's what, I th so I think I'm following. Um, uh, and first of all, let me just, uh, I, th I think it's, it's probably not central to your point, but I just wanna make sure that we're all clear that uh, all of the primordials, all of, all of the implicitly shared objects are all completely transitively frozen in CES. There's no update poss possible for any of the implicitly shared objects. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, with, re with regard to the, the, if I'm understanding correctly, why the membrane makes a difference is that if you share, it doesn't even need to be the global, it's just an object, a, a mutable object. If you share the mutable object directly, you know, the high code shares the mutable object with low code, and then the high code updates it and the low code reads it, then uh, you would say that that, uh, uh, violates um, the security of your model because uh, what was read was something that that was um, information that was placed there after the object was shared. But then, if you put a membrane in the way, yeah. uh, you would say that that when you read through the membrane, that causes a trap in the membrane. The membrane. Uh, then accessing the, the actual new value uh, in the object uh, is doing a declassify when it reveals that, uh, then my, my question, the thing that I'm then puzzled about, my question is if the membrane is completely transparent, which you can get very close to in JavaScript, if, you can, if the membrane, membrane is completely transparent, if it's not imposing any policy um, uh, uh, at all, it's just completely relaying everything, then it's approximately equivalent to not having the membrane there. So if having the membrane makes it secure and having the membrane is not observably different than not having the membrane, how can not having the membrane not be secure? Um. 
I love your question. And I'm very um, surprised for your speed to understand things. And, um, 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 it's about the power. Look, I, I will try, okay? It's not, uh, I, I understand your question and, and I will try to answer. Uh, it's not totally clear in my mind. So it's about the power that um, it's about the power of um, even if if a membrane uh, doesn't do anything, it's about the power of being able to do something. Like it's about the power of controlling. Um, of knowing exactly that you can do something like, for example, uh, even if the membrane doesn't do anything today, maybe tomorrow you can say, if it is the broad object dot prototype, then and null, I mean, nothing, like you, you don't send it or whatever. Like it's, it's about the power of controlling. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to explain, I'm, I'm trying here, like. So let, let me, let me uh, try to respond, I think I'm, so, uh, let's say that that um, if the membrane is not imposing any policy, then the attacker reading through the membrane um, uh, might read the number 77. Um, but the membrane could impose a policy, just you know, just to take a completely silly example, uh, that if the number is 70 or above, it's just going to clamp them to 70. Um, uh, like I said, completely silly example. Um, uh, so the membrane could impose that policy, but the actual membrane that's put there doesn't. And of course, the membrane itself is code. And when you create the membrane, you parameterize it with regard to what the, mem what the policies are. So if you actually create the membrane and you don't provide it that policy, the membrane is an automated mechanism that does not impose the policy. So in that case, it, it's not censoring the numbers greater than 70, although it's in a position where it could. Okay, uh, while you were speaking, I, I got an idea of how to explain this. So uh, what this uh, property is telling you is uh, you have absolute, uh, okay, you have control on, on everything you share. Okay. So it, it's just telling you this. It, it's just telling you, uh, you have this control. Uh, I think this is a way, a, a short way to put it. Uh, this is what we want to, to say. Uh, in, 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 in capability safety, uh, you cannot say, it's different. You cannot say this. What, what capability safety says is whatever you share, is not yours anymore. It can be. It can be used. Um, so th this is slightly stronger. It's like about controlling. Uh, so, so my, my so so let, so the membrane does give you a mechanism by which you could control it, but once you've actually provided access through the membrane then you've already decided what it is you're going to control. And at that point, and if you've decided you're controlling nothing, then you have still decided you're controlling nothing. Uh, and, you would, and you would say that you're still secure because you explicitly decided to control nothing. You are secure for that memory. Right. It's not just you are secure. It's, uh, if uh, I don't have my, my sharing, uh, anymore, but uh, if you... so, let, let me share um, Yonsuk uh, for a second. I, I just want to show a simple thing. Um... So, oh, okay. Um... So yeah, this is a membrane here. So a program is secure for this membrane. So yes, now yes, if your membrane is saying uh, uh, you share everything, 
I, I, remember I told you in my last email that I have intuitions of how this um, fits with capability safety, but it's just intuitions, really. I, I, we are not working on that connection, like we, but I have intuitions. Like if that membrane uh, is, is identity, like it's just passing everything, maybe DDR with that membrane uh, it can be thought as capability safety. But you can say much more here because you can have different membranes and, uh, and capability safety. Yeah, I don't know how, uh, what you can do about capability safety and membranes. Here I know, but if you just tell me capability safety, I have no idea how this really proves anything about membranes. I do not understand the connection. Like uh, I know what is capability safety. I know what is a membrane. I don't know how they connect. Here I, I see it. Can you show the definition of a memory? Because I have a couple of notions and I don't know which one we're using. Membrane, you mean? Yes. Okay, we don't have memory. We have a declassifier, but uh, later on, uh, you know, for us, uh, but Mark, please, you are the authority. Uh, for us, <laughs> a membrane uh, is um, just a preserving object uh, identity. Sorry, I, I, I was asking about memory. Ah, memory, sorry. Um, you, you want the definition of, of memory in our formalism? Yes. OK. Um, so a memory here. Uh, is a mapping from locations to objects. Okay, all right, that's familiar. Like in JavaScript. For the property in particular, it doesn't matter that it's JavaScript, but well, yeah, it's we wanted true. to model JavaScript. If you change, you know, if you update a variable, then then you have a different memory, right? If you? If you update a variable, then that's a different memory, right? You're right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so I, our first question for you is, um, so says in the default configuration doesn't use any memory, right? Sorry, so, so ask the question again, please. Yes, uh, says. Um, if you don't say that you want to use a membrane explicitly, it's, it won't use one. Is that That's correct? correct? That's correct. And, okay. and, the, and the, 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 um, uh, the question that I have is if you, the, uh, I want to, to understand the flaw in the following reasoning process. Okay. Um, if I did use a membrane, then I could impose a policy, and that means I'm in control. If I impose the null policy, well, I'm still in control because I chose to impose the null policy. So if I provide direct access to the object, since I could have decided to use a membrane, I'm still in control because, I've, because by providing direct access, I've also made a policy choice. And the policy choice is essentially identical to the choice of having provided indirect access through a memory, through, sorry, through a membrane uh, with a null policy. Uh, and that's very much the way that we speak about capability security, even aside from membranes, is when we talk about attenuation. Uh, just to go back to sort of our classic uh, Alice, Bob, and Carol, um, uh, when uh, Alice sends to Bob uh, direct access to Carol, then what Alice is granting Bob is full authority to full and perpetual authority to whatever, uh, whatever it is that Carol provides to her clients. And if Alice does not want to provide Bob full access to Carol, then what Alice does is interpose what we call an attenuator. And a, uh, a membrane is one particular form of attenuator. Mm -hmm. But an attenuator is anything that simply reduces the authority 
that Bob now ha has by virtue of going through the attenuator. Bob no longer has direct access to Carol. Mm -hmm. He has access through the attenuator. And then um, uh, the attenuator will, you know, when uh, Bob might think that the attenuator is Carol, Bob might interact with the attenuator as if it's Carol, mm -hmm. and the attenuator might or might not forward operations to the real Carol. Okay. Um, so just staying in the spirit of uh, uh, what we're talking about, let's say that the, let's say what Carol is, is a simple, simple updatable memory location that um, where Carol represents the ability to read whatever that location is, and um, somebody else gets to update that location. Uh, and, Al and Alice, uh, let's say the location is just for holding uh, integers. And now let's say that uh, Alice wants to provide Bob only the ability to read even integers. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's uh, worth contrasting actually two different, um, uh, two different ways that Alice could impose that. Um, one is that uh, the attenuator, when it reads a odd integer, it can just clamp it to the even integer, round it down, and then provide the even integer to Bob. Uh, and then Bob interacting with Carol it seems to be interacting with what he thinks of as Carol. Uh, what he sees is a Carol that only ever reports even integers. Um, I think I think we can just stick with that. So the attenuator could do that, or it could just let through all integers. Yes. Um, and if it just lets through all integers, then Alice doesn't need to spend the overhead of putting the attenuator in place. If the attenuator isn't attenuating, if it's not reducing Bob's authority, then Alice might as well just give Bob direct access to Carol. Mm -hmm. But it's still Alice's choice, it's Alice's policy choice that if she gives Bob direct access, access to Carol, it's in the context where she could have given Bob an attenuator instead. I think the main difference between the object capability in our security property is that we are focusing on implicit interaction. So by definition, the implicit interaction means that uh, can you observe this, some behavior, some interaction or not in the code. So for example, if you pass an object and if the other side uh, um, change the value of this object, then indeed, uh, for example, um, okay, maybe I should share, could, can I share my screen? Yes. Basically, let's say this is uh, there is two parts, trusted and untrusted, and the, this calls like untrusted function foo and object o, and there is a function foo, blah blah. And here, main point here is that even if you call this untrusted function. After then, if the like if the value of g was here, g was 10, 100, but here now g is 200, then this is uh, implicit uh, interaction, and we believe that this is insecure. This kind of interaction is insecure. That's the main point of the our security property. So sorry, uh, sorry g g uh, the variable g. Uh, where is the variable G? Is it is the variable G considered a trusted or an untrusted location? I don't, I don't understand the example yet. This is trusted variable. Okay, let's let's say there is a trusted object or something G O G, and 
g has a field value, x is 100. But here, all of a sudden, g can be uh, g dot x could be 200, depending on what they are doing, depending on some other code. OK. So, um... So uh, the untrusted code has been given access to O, and then the, qu the question that, uh, that would need to be answered here is, does O give access to G? Yes. Well, it, it, it depends on your policy. In, in object capability point of view, yes, if the O gives some uh, value of like O that X was G, then in object capability, you said, it allows, yeah. But um, in so, our so, so, if you put a membrane, if 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 the trusted code does not give the untrusted code access to O, but instead gives it access to O only through a membrane. Mm -hmm. But the membrane is a a membrane with a null policy. Then the the untrusted code. Will never get will never get access to the real O, will therefore never get access to the real G, will never be able to directly assign to G dot X, but can still cause through the membrane it can cause the uh, value of G dot X to be updated to two hundred, but it's causing that because the membrane uh, uh, allowed it by virtue of the fact that the membrane had a null policy. Yeah, yeah. Question, in membrane by this handler, uh, in the code, you can observe this behavior. Membrane handler will treat this 200 and it will assign X. Yes. It means that you can observe this interaction in the code. The, when you say you, you there's, there's two parties here. There's the trusted and the untrusted. Um, the uh, the the both of both the trusted and the untrusted um, uh, are observing somewhat different things, but they're they're um, uh, inferring if they know that there is a membrane, then uh, then they're inferring the same conclusion about what happened. Um, the uh, the untrusted code can only see what the membrane allows it to see. So the, uh, and, and if we assume that the untrusted code does not know that, uh, that the, whether or not the membrane has a null policy, then uh, all the trusted code can know is that the trusted code has given it a view of the world in which an apparent O dot G dot X has been updated to 200. And it's only the trusted code that knows that it has put, that it has given to the untrusted code a membrane with a null policy. Only it knows that the genuine O dot G dot X has been updated to 200. Are, are we, are we in, are we in agreement here? Does that, does, does my statement correspond to your understanding? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you would say that that's all explicit because the handler, the handler actions did the declassify. This is more than declassifying because now we're having a write up, a write from uh, untrusted to trusted. So it's also endorsing, right? Yeah, but we call it the same way. I, I, we know, but we just call it the same. It's just a sharing between compartments. Okay. So, um, so since the trusted code knows that it has provided a membrane with a null policy, um, uh, and the untrusted code does not know that the membrane has a null policy, the untrusted code do also doesn't know whether there is a membrane there or not then if the trusted code had decided not to provide a membrane, then it was also the case that only the trusted code knows 
that it was the genuine O.G.X that got updated to 200 mm -hmm. because uh, that was because it was only the trusted code that made the decision to share the genuine O rather than a membrane. Okay. So the, I, th I think the, um, so what you're, so, so what to, uh, what in your world are the explicit declassification steps that the handler is doing, uh, I think we can just think of a, you can, we can, if we just think of a null membrane everywhere uh, as part of the theory, and then say it's just a transparent implementation optimization to remove null membranes when they're not making an observable difference, Yes. And we can still describe the capability security access as if there's always a null membrane in, in, uh, in the middle that is doing explicit declassification actions. In practice, yes. Uh, in theory, we cannot prove it. But in practice, I agree it's the same and it, it, it makes a lot of sense. OK, great. But uh, yeah, I agree with all your conclusions. But I might have some question uh, for Seth. Uh, Seth in Seth's compartment, compartment, if you do not use membrane, I think there is some kind of ad hoc behavior to me. Is there some kind of, I didn't quite catch that, some kind of what behavior? Not, not consistent behavior. Sure, what? Not consistent. Not consistent, OK. So for example, because you, uh, in compartment uh, after lockdown, you freeze every primordial objects. I'm, I'm sorry. Could you can you speak a little bit more slowly? Okay. You after after the lockdown, you freeze all the primordial objects. So basically, it prevents a, a, a prototype pollution. But let's say. Uh, if you, uh, if you def, uh, declare some new array, extends array, then this new array instance, it, its prototype chain can be polluted because its prototype chain is new array the prototype. That's right. Yeah. That's, so, that's right. But, but, it, but the, the key thing is that the new array prototype is not implicitly shared. Yes, yes, but, but uh, yeah, yeah, you you are saying that, but in, uh, if you are user point of view, like, let's say if I use an SCS, and then uh, it, it seems like a slightly uh, not consistent, because if you share a native array, then its prototype chain is all freezed. But if you start to share some custom objects, then its prototype chain is not protected. Unless you harden it, there, there's a significant burden to, sh to sharing things. We, we, our practice is to harden things before we share them. Right, but it's, but it's up to the trusted code. Or in, in the, in, in speaking in terms of, of your scenario, uh, it's, um, uh, we, we do have, uh, we introduced object.freeze into JavaScript exact, exactly for this purpose. Um, uh, so it's up to the trusted code when creating new array to decide to freeze the prototype. And that's a decision that it can make or not make. And uh, what, so what we're, so, so, you know, programming style is a different set of considerations than, than you know, f f hard formal properties. Uh, but our programming style is very much to avoid accidents, to engage in what we call defensive consistency um, and to Harden those things, harden means tr to transitively freeze, to harden uh, those things that it would be surprising to communicate through by mutating them. So we want to avoid surprises. So um, in a formal sense, the, the G here in your O.G example is just like the new array prototype. The new array is, is like the O. The new array prototype is just an object that O points to. The fact that it points to it as the prototype 
formally doesn't make a difference. From a capability formalism perspective, it's just O pointing at G is, new array, is the new array instance pointing at the new array prototype. Uh, so there's no surprise that the new array prototype can be, mute, can be modified by something that has the new array instance and a membrane would not prevent that. But if the creator of the new array abstraction freezes or hardens the new array constructor, the new array prototype, all the new array methods, uh, then uh, you don't get those nasty surprises. Then instances of new array are just as safe as instances of normal array. I do not want to interrupt this conversation, but if anybody had a hard stop six minutes ago, you're late. Pray continue. So, so does that make sense with regard to, to new array and the, the consistency? Yeah, I understand. So basically you, uh, your language, supports everything, every ingredients for the security. So it depends on user. Yeah, yeah. And let me also emphasize something that um, uh, Dan Connolly has, has uh, said that I really love, which is about, I don't remember if it was 20% or 40%, I'm gonna say about 40% of all the engineering we do at Agoric is fighting the pervasive mutability of JavaScript. It's JavaScript is, is you know, that comes out of the box with everything everywhere being mutable. Uh, my, my previous e-language, which a lot of our programming practices are based on, uh, was really quite the opposite in terms of what the default was. Um, uh, things were default, um, not mutable, and you had to explicitly declare something to be mutable in order to have mutable state. Um, uh, so the reason why new array is mutable uh, in, the, in the scenario that we're talking about is not because as a language designer, I prefer it to be mutable. If CES were simply a new language that, that Agoric was designing, then when you, when you say class new array extends array, uh, absolutely, the normal default would be for new array prototype and the new array constructor and all the new array methods to be frozen. That would certainly be what I would do as a language designer. Uh, the problem is that we're starting from JavaScript uh, and uh, JavaScript, um, uh, we, can, we can preemptively freeze all the primordials um, before code starts running by uh, running our own shim library before other code, before any untrusted code runs. But when you just use existing JavaScript language constructs to create new objects, CES uh, is not in a position to intervene. It's not in a position to change the semantics of JavaScript. So the most we can do is to provide the programmer tools like Harden so the programmer can choose to use CES as a language that has good security properties, but it's up to the programmer to program defensively in that manner. We're also interested in formal verification that they did it right in Jesse. That's right, that's right. Jesse, uh, the, the, the uh, goal for the Jesse design, uh, which we desperately need formal methods help with is um, uh, Jesse is a, um, a st is intended to be a statically checked small subset of CES in which the static checking rules enforce that you're staying within a much more sensible and much more defensible semantics. So in particular, uh, the, the goal of Jesse is to have a set of static checking rules such that uh, no, no object can escape its creation context. And what that, what that means, we need to make precise, but, 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 but just speaking informally first, that no object can escape its creation context 
uh, without being hardened. Um, uh, and, and informally, this, this, your, your, your scenario, your example code, uh, gives us a perfect um, uh, way to explain what we mean by that. Uh, if the trusted code were in Jesse, then the property, um, then O could only be released to the untrusted code after it was hardened. The static checking rules on the trusted code would prevent the trusted code from releasing O to the untrusted code without hardening it first, since hardening does a transitive freeze by property walk, uh, freezing O would freeze G, which would make the property O.G.X unassignable. And in fact, merely by hardening O before releasing O to the untrusted code in this scenario, the untrusted code would not be able to update uh, o.g.x. So, uh, but, the, but the, 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 the coexistence of Jesse and Cess, I think is, uh, is um, really goes to the core of what it is we've been discussing, both in email and in this conversation, which is uh, Cess is, the constraint that the trusted code needs to impose on the untrusted code so that the trusted code can impose policy on the untrusted code. Jesse is the, is the, is the constraints that the, trusted that the author of the trusted code can choose to impose on themselves so that the author of the trusted code can reason more reliably about what their trusted code means and about what their risk is when they expose themselves to the untrusted code. But Jesse is, 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 Jesse is advisory in the sense that um, I don't protect you by imposing Jesse on myself. I protect myself from you by imposing Jesse on myself. And therefore, um, if I choose not to impose Jesse on myself, then I'm not endangering anybody but myself. Um, Yonsok, does uh, what Mark say uh, ring a bell about deep copying? Yeah. So we should talk more, Mark. Uh, I, I have to go now because I am in a workshop uh, um, and I have a session, uh, but that's uh, um, very, very interesting to discuss with you, really. Uh, okay. And what we don't have, we don't have written down, a, a, even on paper, a set of static checking rules for Jesse for hardening things before they're released that we're confident is sound. And what would be wonderful to, I mean, it's, it's, it's what would be wonderful to work with some formal methods people on is to verify that uh, a set of static checking rules for Jesse, such that those static checking rules soundly can be shown to prevent attacks like this without a membrane, just by, by hardening every object that's released. Yeah. So um, what, what, what you said about Jesse, the property you mentioned, uh, we have examples of different membranes here in, in this paper. And one of them, we call it deep copy. And because of your description, it sounds to me like it's the same property. So it also can be described with this uh, DDR property, like the property itself, but with a different membrane called deep copy, you can... Um, yeah. Well, so, 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 um, uh, so yes, but I just do want to introduce a terminology distinction. Uh, what we're able to do purely on top of the language is something called harden that is only transitively walks properties when we come to a function that encapsulates mutable state. We're not in the position 
to lock down the mutable state that's encapsulated in the function. We have another operation called purify that we're working on with Modable that would be a proposal to, to add a new primitive to JavaScript. And purify, if it succeeds, would guarantee that there's transitively no mutable state, including no mutable state in functions. It doesn't do that by locking the functions down. It does that by, by failing, uh, by throwing an exception. If you try to purify something and there is mutable state, hidden mutable state that it cannot lock down. So if purify succeeds, I think it'd be, I think a successful purify is probably like your deep copy. Interesting. What I think I'm hearing that we're winding down. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and thank you very much for attending. Yes, yeah, it's been great. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And and I hope